Part 5 of what we need to teach our daughters. Going right where we left off, 1 Corinthians 7.29. For this I say, brother, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. Life's short. Christians, when Paul's writing this, the current events, they're being persecuted. They're being chased. They're being killed. The families are being disrupted. Problems. Troubles. The Corinthian church itself, it's its a mess. And Paul is telling us that there's people right now who wish they did not get married. They wish they had not made that move as we go into talking about someone who's talking about, thinking about getting married. 30. But this, brethren, I say, time is short. It remains that both they that have wives as though they had none, and they that weep as they weep not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy though they possess not. And what this is saying is there's no outward show. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. We are to live in the world but we are not to be the world. We're not to set for our daughter marriage because it's a kinship. You're the first born child of this family. Well, all your sisters got married. All your brothers got married. Well, it's time for you to get married. That's not the thing we're to set for. We are to put away family and religious traditions when it comes to setting our daughters out and growing them as teenage girls we ought not to put a unnecessary burden upon them that maybe God will not bless everything in the world passes away let's take our Bibles to Mark 12 25 Mark 12 25 marriage will come to an end Mark 12 25 when we get to heaven, will we be married to the person we're married to? Mark 12, 25. In the resurrection, therefore, shall she be of them, for the seven had her to wife. That's the question. Here is a woman who's been married to seven different men, properly by the Jewish law. Her husband died, she married her bro his brother. He died, she married his brother. Seven. Okay, now the question is, Jesus, when we all get to heaven, she can't have seven husbands, but they all had her as their wife. And Jesus answered, said, Do ye not err, because ye know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? He's rebuking them. But they're trying to they're trying to get him. They're trying to get him to fail for when they shall rise from the dead death do us part they neither marry nor are given in marriage there is no marrying there is no marriage in in glory the spouse that you have now death or rapture that ends the marriage You'll be the bride of Christ as one unit, as one body in glory. Marriage is an earthly. The first marriage that God provided with Adam and Eve was to replenish the earth, to repopulate the earth. The help meet that God gave to Adam and Eve was to populate sexual the animals could were not compatible to Adam which would get rid of bestiality so if the animals couldn't do it God put Adam to sleep took of his rib and made a woman and from there you get the first vows by Adam and she's called to help me but when we get to heaven there is no marriage. A vow, 
death do us part. The last Christian born again Bible believing marriage in the Bible will be when we marry Jesus Christ as the bride of Christ. And we couldn't have other wives or husbands because then we'd be disobedient to Jesus. 732. But I would have you without careful. Now we're going to go into a new subject here. I want you to be careful, Paul saying. I want you to think about this. He that is unmarried, single man, care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. A single man can have more time and money to serve God. There's no other person affecting the relationship between him and God. Thirty-three. But he, the man, that is married, he's a husband, care for the things that are of the world, how he, the husband, may please his wife. The wife needs things. She needs material things. She has demands that a single man does not have. She's human. The institution of marriage, I hate to say it like that, but the marriage is a God-ordained gift of God that we heard Paul already tell us early in the chapter. But that wife will need things. That wife will need time that you can no longer give to God. The subject is marriage obstructs full service to God. That's maybe why he said earlier, he said, uh, verse 29. Both they that have wives be as though they had none. And we're not done. Husbands, according to the Bible are to please their wife. We see it over and over. Now, verse 34. There's a difference also between the wife and the virgin. Now we're going to look at the woman. The unmarried, the virgin, woman careth for the things of the Lord like the single guy. That she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married, the wife, Care for the things of the world that she may please her husband. Just like the married guy. We just read a couple verses. So Paul gives us the male and the female. No transgender. He gives us the role of a single man. He gives us the role of a married man. He's given us the role of a virgin. And he's given us the role of a wife. Now in the eyes of God, a Christian woman has two roles. Either she's a virgin or she's a wife. And a possibility, which we haven't got to yet, but a widow. If she is, a vir if she is not a virgin and, is, and not a wife, never been a wife, and not a virgin, she is a fornicator. Plain and simple. We need to teach the chastity of our daughters to remain a virgin to that honeymoon night. When they enter into that honeymoon with their husband, she is to be a God-gift virgin and not a fornicator. Now maybe it's been too late. Isn't it great that the Bible applies to First John 1 John 1.9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And then sometimes, you know, the, the sins that we do and done, we just we got to put it under the blood, we got to bear it, the consequences, and we just move on. But dad, as you're working with a teenage daughter, keep her pure. Keep her a virgin. 
Let the greatest gift that she can give, give to her husband on her honeymoon night, her virginity. Scripture. A virgin wants all for God, just like the single man. It is her and God alone, just like the single man. Same comparison. A wife, she's got to please her husband, just like the married man. He's got to please his wife. He's human, she's human. The husband takes what you can give to God just as, as the wife takes from God. Both of those are equal. And when you talk about the virginity of a, of a woman, it says both body and in spirit. Holy. Your daughter may, okay, you know what? I don't need sex. I don't need to, marry. I can just deal with friends. I can have a friendship, companions, all that. I don't want to have a husband. I want to serve the Lord. And we also need to teach them that, you know what? Okay, that also includes sexual matters. You can't go sleep around because that's fornication. That's not a holy body given to God. When it comes to virgin virginity, it ends when she becomes a wife proper for God. Anything else, it's fornication. That's the Bible. 35. From this I speak. For your own profit. I want you to get this. You can learn from this. You can get from this. Not that I may cast a snare upon you. I don't want to put you in a trap. I don't want to put you in a pit. I don't want to snag you. But for that which is comely. That is natural. Normal. Proper. And that ye may attend upon the Lord. The single man. The single woman. You can give up to the Lord. I'm not saying you can't as a husband or wife. But you can give more as a single. You can give more as a virgin. It's better in a marriage because you're two people. You're one. You're intertwined. You're like a rope. Together. You can serve the Lord. But things can happen. That you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. There goes Paul again. He's leaning again to unmarried. Don't get married. He's calling marriage a distraction. King James 16, 11, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35. A Christian is to preach the gospel to every creature in the world. Go in all the world and preach the gospel. It's great when you can do it as a husband and wife. It's great when you can do it as a family, as my family does. It's a wonderful thing. And thank God over the years uh, I've had my spouses in hospitals where they don't go. Go do it. You don't need to be here. Go do it. And there may be some cases where you've got to stay in that hospital room. There's times, emotions that you need to spend time with your spouse where you think you could do for God. You may not be able to go knocking on doors because your spouse wants time. You might be able to want to take money and, hey, I want to give it to this missionary. But you know what? Your wife needs a restaurant. She's been working so hard. It's so hot. Give her a break. Take that $20, whatever you want to give. And say, hey, let's just go out to eat. And a single person doesn't have that. You can say, oh, $20 restaurant? Oh, well, let's go home and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I'm going to give that to the Lord. And if a spouse does not want to serve the Lord anymore, don't want it, that's it. Then you got conflict. They sin. And you are hindered, male or female. If the spouse quits service, there's a conflict. They've sinned, and you are hindered.
Whereas a single, I mean, all right, you don't want to serve no more. That's that's you. No one else is affecting it. You want to quit serving no more. That's you alone. You're not 36. But if any man think, all right, any man, if any man, a father, like you and me, think that he, the father, behave himself, the father, uncommonly, unnatural, unregular, toward his virgin, the daughter, your daughter, my daughter, if she passed the flower of age, she, she's at age, she's legal limit, and needs so require, what's the need so require? Paul's already told us. It is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. But, verse 9, if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it's better to marry than burn. Okay? Pass the flower. It needs so require. You don't want her to fornicate. You don't want her works to be burned. Let him do what he will. Okay, it's your choice now. He sinneth not. Let them marry. God has given us, the husband, the power for our daughters that are under our roof, under our authority, who she is to honor the father, to say yes to a marriage. And when you go to a marriage ceremony and the preacher said, who gives this woman? And the father will say, I give my daughter to this man. That falls right out of 1 Corinthians 7, verse 36. That's scripture for the dad to say, I give my daughter. We just read it. And giving your daughter to marriage is not a sin. Paul says that two or three times in this passage. Marriage is not a sin. Thirty-seven. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's not a sin do it lower he the father that standeth steadfast in his heart for the heart man believes on the righteous a fool has said in his heart there's no God steadfast you're stubborn you're gonna put up a fight you're gonna stand your ground it is your conviction dad Having no necessity. No one is making you come to this conclusion. No one is drawing upon what you're doing. No one. No outside influence. No money, no guns, no torture. But has power over his own will. There is no one forcing you. And has so decreed. In his heart. You know what this decree of in, in, in the Old Testament with the kings? It was a law. It was a writing of the king. It was sealed. It was law. In the his heart, again, not head, not wallet. It's a heart matter. That he will keep his virgin. Do it well. Now, before I come on, comment on that, let's go to Exodus 22.17. Exodus 22:17. See about this. Scripture is scripture, and not many will will agree with me on this subject. This is one of them subject that this is what I think the scriptures say. This is what 22:17. If her father utterly refused to give her unto him. God has empowered the father, the rights of his daughter, because she's under his roof, 
under his authority. She's to give honor to the father and the mother. You've been paying her bills. You've been taken care of. You have been given the biblical right when she says, I want to marry. No. Or yes. <laughs> but when Paul puts that scale out, no or yes when it comes to marriage, he tips the scale to being unmarried, single. He says, you let her marry, it's no sin. But if you say no, you don't approve of it. Exodus 22, 17. You do well to let her not marry. You do well. That's what Paul said. There's no sin in the marriage. But... If you don't allow them to get married, or you don't have her to get married, you do well. So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well. Oh, look, wait a minute. Paul, you said you'd do well if you didn't give her into marriage. Now you say, if you let her give into marriage, it do well. Equal. You don't let her marry, do well. You let her marry, you do well. But he that giveth her not in marriage... Do it better. Oh, Paul just leaned to the non-marriage side again, being single. So self-explanatory in 38, the question is, do you want your daughter to do well? You do? Well, we all do. I do. Or do we want our daughter to do better? Well, let her get married. Better, let her not get married. The wife, our daughter, is bound by law. Uh-oh. We're not under law. We're not under grace. What did Paul just say? There's a law to marriage. There's no law to the single. There's no law to the virgin. That for, your daughter may come up 30 years old and say, you know, I finally found that guy. I've decided I want to get married. Now, there is no law like, like an institution would say, you, you know, you've got to remain a perpetual virgin for the rest of your life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. No, that ain't me. If that gift of God, a spouse, comes up at 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and that's the person that you you affirm, you prayed, and that's who God wants you to be with. You're doing well if you marry him. But if you can remain single, that's better. But to prevent fornication, verse 1, and not to burn, verse 9, in lust, Go from better to well. Being single is better, but being well is a lot better than being a fornicator and in sin. And if you become a fornicator, and then later on you do find that right person, well, in the honeymoon, you're no longer a virgin, you're a fornicator. And you didn't do better. You sinned. We got to make sure our daughters stay virgins for God or for their husbands on their honeymoon night. That's a well or that's a better. And well or better is not fornication. Would you agree with me? Marriage, it says, as long as her husband liveth, bound, you tied the knot. That's what it's called, right? They tied the knot. That comes out of 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. 
And we read it earlier in this chapter. The law for a married couple. As long as a husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to... Okay, stop there for a minute. So the law of marriage is you stay with that spouse till they die. That's the law of marriage. Now, whether we've broken the law, where we've gone against that law, and we didn't know, and 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And, you know, we just put it under the blood. We keep going. We may have to suffer the consequence. We're all sinners. We've all gone against the Bible somewhere. I have. I'm a sinner. I'm a saved sinner. But marriage has a bound. Some idiots call it, oh, you know, my ball and chain. You're an idiot. Okay? Just absolutely idiot. You can quote me on that. Idiot. I've been married twice and I never had a ball and chain. I've had all kinds of troubles, difficulties, fights, and stuff like that. Okay? If her husband be dead. Now let's look at something else here. Dads, me, need to teach our daughters. You get married to church or a field somewhere, you know, barn or whatever. You got the preacher. You got the, the bride. You got the groom. You got the families. You got friends and relatives. We need to teach our daughters when that marriage day, that day when it comes up before the altar, we need to teach our daughters, number one, God is there if you're a born-again Bible-believing Christian. If it's a Christian union, God's there. The eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the good and evil. Didn't we read a verse in Corinthians and say that I paid for that body? You are bought with a price. The Holy Spirit that dwells with us. So as born-again Bible-believing Christians, dads, we need to teach our children God is there, first of all. We need, uh, hopefully that preacher is a right preacher. So if that preacher is right in the Lord, not only are we standing before God, but we are standing in front of a pastor, a head of authority of the church that God has set as an ambassador of the God who's there. I hope he has a King James Bible. So we got the Holy Spirit in us. We got God watching us. The eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. And he is carrying the word in his hands, I hope. John 1 says that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But with God present, the Holy Spirit in us, the word of God, Jesus Christ. You got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit right there. Between this one who's going to be a wife and this one who's going to be a husband. Now he's going to open up and he's going to gab. The preacher. And then he's going to come to a part. He's going to say, do you take... Well, first of all, he's going to say... After she marches down, he's going to tell the... Who gives this woman? And the father is going to speak up and say, I... The father of the bride is going to say, I give this woman to this guy. First Corinthians 7... 36. But if any man think that he behaved himself uncommonly towards his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. When that preacher asks, Who gives this woman? and that father responds with, I do, that is scripture. As in the Bible that that preacher is holding in his hand. Authority that God who is present has given us dads over our daughter who is right there about to get married. Dads, there are two chances for you to get that, three chances for you to get your daughter out of that marriage if you do not approve. Number one, before they even come before the church. Number two, when he says, who gives this woman? You can say, I don't. I absolutely rebel and go. She does not have my blessings. You don't even have to go. Number three, he said, who, who this doesn't think this marriage, you could also stand up then to speak up. 
But let's get God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, a preacher, hopefully right, and we'll assume everything's right. The Father has, by Scripture, has said, I will give this daughter of mine to him. Now the preacher will say, unto death do you part. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty. To death do you part, 1 Corinthians 7.39. That's scripture. That's doctrine. The father has his scripture. Both the husband-to-be and the wife-to-be has their scripture out of what we've been reading out of 1 Corinthians 7. We need to teach our daughters that the sanctification, the holiness of the marriage before all the witnesses, before all the scripture that is mentioned in that service. That even Solomon, and the Bible says in, in the book of Ecclesiastes and in the law, if you're going to vow a vow, do not slack to pay it. It is better that you don't even open up your mouth at all. When you say, I do, You have signed, sealed, and delivered you to that man and you to that woman in the eyes of God, in the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, in the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ, with the pastor, the representative of God, as a witness, before both, well, before your parents, maybe one day may not be there, before your parents and before all your friends and family, in the congregation of God, you stand out and say, Scripture bounds, I'm going to do what the Bible says. How's that? She is at liberty to marry to whom she will. Uh oh. Now notice something else here. She's been married. Her husband dies. Paul says she has liberty to marry. She doesn't have to go back to her father. She has liberty now. And so you see what the conclusion is. A woman, a virgin, is under the authority of her father in his house. Okay? When she takes her husband and they become husband and wife, there is no more fatherly, there is no more dad. I'm trying to think of the word authority over that woman it's gone when you come together your daughter comes together with that man and become husband and wife the authority of the father now goes to the authority of her husband the honoring of thy father and mother now goes to the honor of the marriage bed Now, I have no authority if my daughter gets married to go in her house and tell her what to do. I do not have that authority no more. That authority is given to her husband. I can't walk up to my daughter who got married and say, I don't like that dress. Get rid of it. I have no more of that authority. It's gone. Now, if her husband likes that dress... If I buy her a dress, I like it, and he doesn't. He has authority to say, no, no, you take it back or you just put it in the closet. Don't you ever wear that. And I can't say nothing. Now, my daughter can come to me for advice, and I can give her advice, and she could adhere or not adhere. And if she didn't listen to me, that wouldn't be rebellion. So... The marriage bed transferred the authority of the dad to the husband. And we'll see that later. She's at liberty to marry to whom she will. And plus, probably now she's got experience. She's lived with a man for a while. He... But there is only one clause put. 
only in the Lord. A saved person. Now, why would Paul have to say that to a widow? Her husband's just died. She's got bills. She no income. She might be thinking forcefully and, and worried and concerned. Oh, I'm gonna have to marry the first guy. And, and Paul's like, calm down, relax, trust the Lord. Wait for a saved man. Don't go out and just marry anybody. Matter of fact, you're only the marry in the Lord. After your husband died. So death frees the law of marriage. And Paul leaves us to marry saved individuals. Now, I'm just assuming that this video is being listened to by Christians. How can Paul then say 35 and 36 and 37? You know, only marry a saved person. Why do you only mention it in 39? Because our daughters are Google and Gaga over this guy, Prince Charming. He's Mr. Wonderful. She ain't thinking about anything but, ooh. And it's the responsibility that God has given us fathers to say yes or no to power that it's self-explanatory, it's self-evident that the first qualification we ought to see for our daughter's husband to be is he saved? No, sometimes the first qualification is the company he works for, the company his family works, the money he's got. Oh, look at the car. No, the first qualification is self-evident by Paul that that guy your daughter is seeking is a saved individual. One for one. 50-50. He's saved or he's not saved. If he's not saved, <coughs> he needs to go. Number two. I'm giving the rules here for the husband to be for your daughter. Number one, he has to be saved. Number, if he ain't, get rid of him. If your daughter doesn't get rid of him, she's rebelling against you, the father. You have the power to say no. She don't obey that power. She's rebelling. And you don't have to bless it. But let's let's move on. Number one, he has to be saved. Number two, he has to be approved by your pastor or his pastor. He may go to another church. You think about that. With your power as the authority over your daughter, you're going to have her let somebody in another church or... Does have to be your church. But whatever you think about church, what's his pastor? Would it be your pastor? Or what's his pastor <coughs> say his character is? Pastor agrees and, and approves. Boom. He's saved, and the pastor, no, 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 you don't have nothing to do with that guy. The guy needs to go. Again, if door, and she just rebels and rebellion. But two positive marks. He's saved, the pastor approves. Number three, is he evangelistic? Now, he may not do what you do. But he can pass out tracts, he can go door knocking, he can on the street ministry, he can mail out tracts, he can just talk to people. Is he going to all the world and preaching the gospel some way, somehow? Yes, another great qualification. No, I throw him out. I mean, because you know, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. Now, hopefully, that. You're saved, your daughter's saved, your family's approved of the pastor, you're going all the world to preach the gospel, I hope, Dad. So, if that's your case in your family, you're going to turn your daughter to someone who's not doing it? You'd be a fool. Next one. 
Does he actively read his Bible daily? And the Bible says, if a woman has a question, she's to go into her house and ask her husband, can he answer Bible questions? Has and will and does he study the word so he can be approved unto God and your daughter? No, he needs to go. He has to be saved. He has to be approved by the pastor. He has to be evangelistic and he's got to be actively in the word. And then time. We'll see what kind of true character he is. Time. You play him out. You, you seek him out. You, you, you test him. You see what he is and who he is and what he is. But when we conclude 1 Corinthians 7, on a scale 1 to 10, 1 being don't do it, 10 don't do it, with marriage, Paul is a 5 right in the middle but then he goes to six. I forget what one. One don't do it. Ten don't do it. He's a four. Leaning to don't do it. But then he goes to six. It's well. There's no sin if you lean to the marriage. After the checklist I just gave you. But he goes back to three. Said it's better if you don't. And if you don't get married and you fornicate, now you sin. That's worse. Better if you don't get married, but well, getting married is much better than being a fornicating sinner. And that's where Paul leaves us.